biblical spirituality as our own experience, right? That, that then how does our interaction with the scripture become about our, our ownership of our own ideas of scripture, right? And, and, and I think, I believe, or I experience, a lot of the repulsiveness to scripture comes from that notion that there's some other outside right idea, right, that isn't of me, and that I have to kind of join this outside rightness, right, and actually kind of leave me, leave any discomfort I have, or leave any kind of like, well, that doesn't sound right. What is, you know, what just happened? Now, what do you mean, kill all the women and children? You know, and it's you know, it's like, oh no, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to join this idea of the power of God, right? So I, I'm going to leave my discomfort, and I'm and and so to that end, I'm going to try to talk about my own experience with biblical spirituality and how I use the Bible. I that's, that's it. That's all that's happening. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, does that track? Is there, are we all, are we all move, moving together? And does anyone have any comments thus far? Any complete other ideas of spirituality? Um, I read the Bible. I think, in all honesty, I started to read the Bible seriously the way I start most things, because I want to be right. right? I, I love it. I love being right. I totally want to know more than you about something. You know, if somebody who has, I, I just adore it. Right? And, and I have, I'm, um, you know, I, it's like I have a big enough brain and I approach things with enough suspicion, you know, that something is like, that doesn't sound right. I'm going to go get a different right answer and come back to you, right? And so, you know, that I, I adore being right. And, and so I went, I went to graduate school and I showed up for our required biblical courses with bells on. I mean, I was like, oh, let's do it. You know, like, this is awesome. You know, let's get in there. I had counterparts in school who, th these were the last classes they, they took. They were incredibly, um, more, I think, exhausted with how the Bible had been used in their lives. You know, that they just, and any kind of hint that this was going to be used, how it was used when they were kids, or, you know, they were just like, I, I can quote chapter and verse, and it's frankly just not where it's at for me, right? Like I don't. This isn't not not a not a not a biblical text person, and um, and so I believe, and I began to experience myself as a little more empty towards the scripture, right? That I didn't actually. I'm not quite as loaded, you know. As much as I love to be right, and we all come with ourselves. I'm not quite as, I, I, I learned, oh, I'm not quite as loaded as other people. You know, that this is, I can take an idea and assimilate it, and it doesn't, it doesn't threaten some other notion I have about God, right? Um, I don't need Paul to be something for me to continue to believe what I believe, right? I don't, I'm, I, I don't have that, you know, it's, I could I live happily in this world that John presents Jesus way differently than Matthew does. You know, that doesn't I'm not conflicted or confused and you know it's not that doesn't shake something inside of me. I, I think it's fascinating, I find it interesting, I can discuss it forever and ever. We could have day long retreats just going into one book. I'm a complete nerd. I seriously, I met my mentor, you know, on Friday morning when we were going over the Greek and you get to this thing with Paul with the Christos Christi and what did he mean? What is that in Christ or of Christ or around Christ? What is that participle? I think that's awesome, right? <laughs> and other people are just like, okay, first, that totally makes me want to vomit, right? <laughs> or second, that's really important. Is it in Christ or of Christ or with Christ, right? Like that's super important, you know. And for me, it's like, oh, no, no, no. you know, I could just discuss all day all the different possibilities, you know. So I'm, I, I am, you know, and I feel very blessed in that way. Um, and so I learn different perspectives when I approach the text. The text itself is a perspective, right? 
different people and different scholars are different perspectives. I mean, for me, that's how I personally enter that expansiveness, right? That limitlessness. And um, and I and I and I adore that. I'm confronted with my own ideas. Um, I'm confronted even intellectually when I know the Bible self contradicts, right? The Bible contradicts. And if you want to find something, if you want to support some notion, I guarantee the Bible's going to support it for you, right? And then at some other point, it's not going to support it. And so there is. Um, you know, I, I am always confronted with myself because I'm so happy when the Bible can, you know, support something I already believe, and I'm so unhappy when it doesn't. You know, I am, I am very, I do not like that one bit, and we'll get to that because we're going to discuss this week. I thought we would discuss Paul a little bit, and maybe next week we'll discuss the Gospels a little bit, right? And and how that, and in both places that plays out, right? This thing where it's like I'm a feminist theologian. What do I like in Paul, and what makes me a little nauseous, right? And what do I do with that, right? What then happens? Um, yeah, I do. I do like the expansive nature of the Bible. It is the expansiveness of biblical spirituality, image-wise, kind of goes deep. That you can you can limitlessly mine in to a specific place, right? That if the Bible were a line like this, you just pick a spot on the line and drop. And you, in that drop, you can fall endlessly, right? And chase different perspectives and views. Um, my field is Thecla, the Acts of Paul and Thecla, which is a text that isn't in the Bible, obviously, and uh, it's called extra canonical. And at a time in the second century, there were all of these different acts written about the apostles, right? And the Acts of Paul is one of them. Chapters three and four are the Acts of Paul and Thecla. And um, Thecla was a female follower of Paul. And there's this, and part of that text, a lot of scholars, myself included, really discuss Galatians. There is no slave or free. There is no Jew or Gentile. There is no man and woman. Right? That that is in the Acts of Paul and Thecla. That particular part of Galatians is often used. Like it, it seems as if they were responding to this, which is terrific. Except the problem is in other verified letters of Paul in Corinthians and other spots in Galatians. He is very clear about what he thinks the roles of women are, right? That men are the head, women are the body. You know, he is, he, there is a, there, he, he contradicts, right, this idea that in the spiritual life, he either contradicts it or we need to interpret it, right? In the physical world, this is women's roles, and in the spiritual world, this is, there is no gender. Right? And how we choose to assimilate that is really fascinating, right? Which is how I end up in Paul. I end up to Paul through the acts of Paul and Thecla, even though I would love to only study Thecla and what happens to her in the field. You, you, you must know your Paul, right? And so, and, and that particular, so I get into places in the Bible and then I read Galatians, I read, uh, I learn where it is in the Bible, I, I, you know, what? where is it, what's the point, why was it written, who is it written to, right? What did, what did early people say about it, what did later people say about it, what is the new scholarship, and that's just these three sentences, right? And, uh, and on and on, I love that, right, because I'm a nerd. And, um, and <laughs> I was I was saying to John before this started, what I don't do is a daily devotional, right? I don't do a daily biblical devotional. And, and if I had planned this differently, I think I would have a counterpart standing right here who does, right? Who does this other way of approaching biblical spirituality. Um, but that's how I end up confronting myself. I end up confronting myself and my ideas about what the Bible needs to say or doesn't need to say or who Paul needs to have been or not need to have been. 
you know, by going deep into one part. Right? That then I learn about myself, right? Like how um, there's this my my mentor at St. Kate's, we were once talking on the phone about this conflict, how Paul presents women, right? And he is um, he is a he is a biblical scholar. I'm a systematician. I'm a feminist scholar. He's a biblical scholar. And he offhandedly says on the phone, it wouldn't bother me if we were, if somehow someone magically was able to prove that Paul thought women were inferior to men, right? Honestly thought that, right? He was like, that wouldn't bother me. I almost hung up on him, right? I and mean, I almost was like, click, you know, like you had fired, you're not your mentor anymore. Like, what do you mean? I had to write it on a stick em. My response was, so strong, right? Because I was like, what do you mean it wouldn't bother you if someone could prove that Paul thought women were inferior to men? Like, what does that mean that that wouldn't bother you? And I, I had that stick them in front of my computer for a while, and finally I realized, you know, Vince is Vince. Vince is who Vince is, and I learned a lot from him. I'm so grateful for him in my life. He is interested in finding a truthiness in the scripture, right? And so if somebody were able to find some kind of truth, he would really think that is all scholars' responsibility to then assimilate that truth, right? I mean, if you find out, you know, this was written in the third century and not the second century, that's going to change the social climate and the Christian environment that was written in, you then need to change your scholarship around it. And he's just kind of a robot in that way. I mean, a little more robotic than I am, right? Or I'm a little more emotional, or I'm like, no, oh, that'd be really bad. Like, let me tell you, that'd be really bad if someone were actually able to prove that Paul thought women were inferior to men. That would be bad news. You know, you might actually possibly want to suppress that piece of information. You know? <laughs> and, and he was like, oh, no, that'd be fine. You know, that, that would be the truth, and you'd cope with that truth in your scholarship. Right? Then you then you write about that truth and what that means. I was like, oh no, not no. You know, but that that is all part of the biblical spirituality, right? Where it's like, what do I need this to say? What do I believe it is before I even walk towards it? You know? And can it have a power that I don't give it? Which I actually think it can, right? I think it has a power in our society, it has a power in how we treat each other, you know. But it, you know, it, there is, it is different than reading a fiction book or a magazine. You know, something, something different is happening there. Um, let's focus, let's, let's flip to Paul for a moment and chat about Paul. Um, and the Apostle Paul, in the New Testament, there are four Gospels. And then we get to the epistles, the letters. The Greek word for letter is epistle. We get to the epistles. Seven of them are verified letters of Paul. The rest of them, it is either a matter of faith to say, yes, I believe that was written by Paul, or it is simply unverified, we do not know, right? And, um, and then there are later epistles that Generally speaking, scholarship degrees weren't written by Paul, but they're credited to Paul, right? Which was not plagiarism or a way to trick or fool us. It was a very regular way of honoring somebody, right? That was not intended to, um, to make us think something. It is much more uh, indication of how much authority Paul had early, right? Very early. Paul emerged as a leader, so much so that people would write in his style, right? So much so that appropriating his ideas and clarifying them was important really early on. And um, uh, Galatians and Corinthians are both letters of Paul. Those are, those are both Paul's letters. Paul uh, went out on three missions. Um, from Jerusalem. He was famously walking on the road to Damascus, which I think might be in only one of his stories of his, of his apocalypse, what he calls his apocalypse, his spiritual conversion. And um, he uh, met the risen Christ in a vision, and meeting the risen Christ is the 
criteria for being a disciple. Right? That's why it is so important who saw Christ after Christ rose. Right? They, they, those people that saw Christ after Christ rose, which we'll discuss next week, in every gospel is the women, and then the men, um, those are the apostles. Right? They took on a call for discipleship, and Paul owns that call for discipleship in his meeting of Paul on, or in, in his meeting of Christ, the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. Um, Philippians predates any of the other gospels, so the actual earliest Christian writing we have is Paul's. Um, he certainly deserves all the authority he gets. He, he, he definitely earned it the hard way. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he went on and on and on about how hard it was. Believe me, you, you can't read his letters without understanding all the sacrifices Paul made to bring us this message. <laughs> um, we tradition has it that Paul was killed in Rome. We actually don't know historically how Paul was killed. Um, I find this particular piece of Paul history, just in terms of the history, fascinating actually, that we don't know how Paul died. And there's a number of different theories, and all the different theories kind of pop in a different part of the brain. Um, one of them is that the death was so gruesome no one spoke about it, which I I somewhat reject because crucifixion is so gruesome, right? Where it's like, I think, I, I think we know. You know, there, there seemed to be some, they definitely wrote down gruesome stuff and, and, and passed that on. The other idea is that his death was so such common knowledge, no one actually thought to write it down, right? That, that's like so common, everyone knew. The other idea is that he died in a shipwreck in his letter to Romans, which is his last verified oldest letter of Paul, in his letter to Romans, he says, and then I'm going on to what we now call Spain. And, um, and so there's some thought that he died in a shipwreck on his way to Spain from Rome. Right? Um, and that it was kind of so banal that no one wrote it down, right? It just everyone thought he, he either made it or he didn't make it, right? kind of went out on this last mission and didn't come back. There's nothing particularly interesting in that. That's, that's Paul. And what happened to Paul? Paul was, again, in his letters, he will remind us again and again, a very good Jew, very, very well versed in the text, and he believed himself the apostle to the Gentiles, which created tension with the Jerusalem church where they were the apostles to the Jews, right? So right out of the gate, in the first century, there was a difference. There was a difference between how the ideas of Jesus in the gospel and the risen Christ were being used in Jerusalem and how the ideas of Jesus in the gospel and the risen Christ were being used outside of Jerusalem uh, in the diaspora. And all of those things we get in and outside of Paul. Um, and Paul focuses on the risen Christ. He says very little about the life and times. right? So we don't get a lot of gospel information from him. His, his focus is this is joining the body of the risen. And, um, and, and that's, his, uh, that's his perspective. One of the things I learned about Paul later that I thought was really important was that he believed the second coming was coming really soon, like really soon, like in our, like in his lifetime, right? He did not think he was going to die a natural death. He thought the second coming was going to happen. Um, and a lot of his letters, or some of his letters, his later letters, he starts talking about these Christian communities are writing him like we're really concerned because the members of our community are dying before the second coming has happened, right? Which is how we get this, this, this information. For me, this idea, this, this, uh, this, uh, his. His ideas of the second coming are important for me because it informs how he talks about staying where you are, which is 
one of the messages of Paul that has been historically abused, right? Stay as you are, right? Just stay as you are. If you are a slave, stay a slave. Be a good slave and be a slave to your master, right? If you, if you are oppressed, just stay in your oppression. Stay there, right? And be as good of a member in Christ as you can in your oppression. And this is a lot why, why people, why um, some people are pretty repulsed by Paul is this historical use of his words, right? That, this, that there is a history, a tragic history of using Paul in this way, and uh, in this like, don't fight the patriarchy, right? That's not where your energy should go. Your energy should go with joining Christ and being a good Christian. And what clicked for me in learning, oh, Paul thought the world was going to end in seven days, right? I mean, really did. I mean, really like a thief in the night, right? The second coming is, is imminent. Right, right around the corner. And that, I, I had a well of forgiveness for Paul, right? One, Paul isn't in charge of how Paul is used, right? Which is, so immediately we have to forgive him because right out of the gate in the pastoral epistles, Paul's authority is gonna be used to keep women in a certain place, to organize churches a certain way. I mean, there's an establishment there that's happening that's frustrating, you know? And I, and, and, I, and, I, and I found this well of forgiveness and understanding where it's like, oh, I see, right? He's going out on his three missions. He's creating these communities. He's bringing people into Christ. He genuinely and honestly thought the world is going to end in seven days. Do not spend your energy trying to change the entire political system. It doesn't matter. Christ is going to come back in seven days and change it for us. Right? Not your job. Not your job. Right? Your job is to be a good Christian. And so then it says, oh, okay, you know, I'm, I, I can be careful about how I appropriate Paul. Right? And I don't have to take it on how it's been used over the centuries. This is one of my favorite new books. One of my favorite new books that I'm reading is Jesus and the Disinherited by Howard Thurman. I'm going to pass it around. Right? It's new to me. It is not new to scholarship. Right, and I, Jesus, uh, Howard Thurman is myth has it. The Thurman family was close to the King family, and as it ha as as the myth goes, Martin Luther King carried this book around with him. It was written in 1945, and Howard Thurman is um, a classic liberation theologian in the way that he's shifting the focus from Paul and this idea of like authority, authority, authority to clicking it over to the Gospels, what was Christ teaching, right? And we see it even now in our current political, like Matthew, you know, I mean, people, there's a Matthew movement, right? Are we, are we living what's taught in Matthew? And what Thurman says is that I used to, uh, his grandmother was a slave, freed, and um, Thurman, as he became educated, he would, and his grandmother couldn't read, and she would always have him read the Gospels, right? Or read the Gospels to me, read the Gospels to me, right? And then that's what he did. Howard Thurman read the Gospels to his grandmother. And finally, he's off at college, and he's studying, and he comes back, and it occurs to him, like, why don't we ever read Paul's letters, right? Why aren't we reading Paul's letters? And his grandmother says, I hate Paul's letters. That's what the white preacher would read when he came to the plantation. Right? That's, that's what we were taught on the plantation. I don't ever want to read Paul's letters. I've had enough. I, we were only reading the Gospels. And that, so that, I mean, this is like, you know. People hate Paul, and that's cool, right? Like, and everyone's allowed, and that's that, and you all, everyone's allowed to have their own experience. But that's like visceral, you know. And the thing that Thurman says about Paul in the first chapter that I find really interesting is that Christ was a Christ was not a member of the Roman Empire, and Paul was. And this is one of those facts. This is one of those historical. This is. One of those facts that doesn't go down as a historical fact about Paul, because it's only said in Acts, 
right? So for something to be historically verified, historians want all of these different, they want different sources to it. And in Acts, it's mentioned that Paul is a member, uh, is, a, is a Roman. And what Thurman is saying is that Jesus, the pressing question in Jesus and the Disinherited for Thurman is that it, for him, he's saying, Jesus lived at a time where the only question you were asking yourself is how do I act vis-a-vis -vis the Romans, right? We are oppressed, right? We are not Roman citizens. We do not have rights. They are in our land. The pressing question for Thurman as a disinherited, right, is how, how do we act towards the Romans? And what Thurman is saying is that is that Paul was not asking that question because he was a Roman citizen. So Jesus and Paul fundamentally had this different attitude towards authority on a deep and fundamental level, right? I mean, assuming we're all American citizens here, right? I, I don't want to jump to any assumptions, but assuming we're all American citizens here, we ask different questions about how we conduct ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the government than somebody who's undocumented. We just ask different questions, right? We approach the system differently. We understand we enjoy a certain privilege, right? Presumably, if we're arrested, there'll be a trial, which was also the case with Paul. So Paul, in his letters, is like, I was beaten here, I blah, 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 and he's just like, let go out of the city. And the reason is because he could appeal directly to Caesar as a Roman citizen. And if Jesus got arrested, he was not going to enjoy the same privilege. Right? That, that privilege was not available to him. And so for, for Thurman, this is, and I, I mean, it's really I'm blue. And it isn't, and again, for my mentor, interestingly, right, for my mentor, he's like, well, that's not, you can't historically verify that Paul was a Roman. It's only in, we only have one source, right? That's only in Acts. So he's a little bit like, mm, that's nice for spirituality and stuff, but like for actual scriptural, uh, academic script, scriptural purposes, right? You may or may not want to overly <laughs> appropriate that, right? But in my spirituality, it's like, oh yeah, these are all the things I, I, it softens me greatly to identify with Paul in any way, right? To say, oh, okay, I get it. Paul had more privilege than Jesus. I have way more privilege than Jesus, right? And it, it softens me, right? Then I'm, I'm a little softer when I approach him as opposed to this, like, Paul was used by the masters on the plantation and I can't, you know? You know, Paul, Paul and his men are the head of the, I can't, I can't, you know, it just, it, it make me crazy. And it's like, no, actually, Paul isn't making me crazy. Paul, Paul's just doing what Paul does. Um, I'm going to take a quick look, see what we here. Comments, am I, as I trot through, I, I can talk about that. It's really, we're supposed to be having a discussion, I can just chat, 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 chat. <laughs> yes. Well, according to what you said previously about Paul, um, he really believed in the second coming going to, going to happen. So he wasn't taking it as a, a political uh, view that he was Roman didn't really matter, did it? Because the second coming was coming. So you really don't have a basis to hate Paul. I mean, you you know, if you put him in the perspective of politics of oppressing people, yeah, but that wasn't his intention. No, of course not. Right, that's okay. just how it was used. I'm just right. clarifying that in my own head. Oh yeah, no, thank you, thank you. And and I and I, I should have. I don't mean to blaspheme or you know. I'm, I'm certainly not uh, trying to. You know, it's it isn't. And yeah, I sound way too more judgmental than I am. I actually have grown to as much as in my spiritual life. Who who talks to me is Stella. Right? She's, she's kind of always murmuring in the background to me, you know. Um, uh, it is, I can't have a conversation with her without kind of assimilating all on a, on a, on a real, you know, in a real way, not just in a judgmental way, right? In a, in, in a real, in authentic, right? Um, and Paul was authentically, deeply, deeply a believer in Christ. Yeah. There is 
this sentence, I could go on and on and on about it because um, in the acts of Paul and Thecla, which someday I will hold you all hostage and tell you about my work, there will be, it will, it, it will be fascinating. Um, in the acts of Paul and Thecla, Thecla starts out as an engaged female in Iconium, Thecla of Iconium, and she hears Paul teaching in the house, in the church house, house church next door, and um, she is immediately converted. Right. She, this is one of those stories of an immediate conversion and uh, almost flat, right? That she doesn't have a lot of, she, there's not a lot of conflict in her conversion, right? She is just like immediately smitten. And uh, in Iconium, they try to burn her, but she is saved. The fires are doused. She goes to find Paul. They end up in Antioch. In Antioch, someone tries to rape her, and she fends that person off, but in so doing, she dishonors him, and she ends up in the arena. In the arena, she is saved, right? And then she finds Paul then a second time, and Paul, and, and after this arena incident, she, uh, she, she teaches, basically, and then she finds Paul, and Paul says, go and baptize and teach really important text because of the baptized piece, right, of that, like, like uh, that were women baptizing in the first and second century, right, and so it, with, a, not only that, but were women baptizing using the authority of Paul, right, that's, these are, these are some of the questions, and so one of the ideas about the Acts of Paul and Thecla is that was there this notion that women thought they became male in social stature through baptism, right? That in becoming Christ, in putting on Christ, then did you take on the male privilege of Christ? Pretty, it's an interesting question, right? Like, oh, I'm interested. I'm super interested in this, right? But what would that mean for feminism? You know, then do I reject my femininity? What's happening here? You know, this this is what I do with my time. Right? So this, this is what I'm doing when I'm not with you, right? As I'm sitting around trying to think about. And so in and one of the reasons that people think Galatians is used um, is this and I forgot maybe the glasses, but we're going to do this together. Um, Galatians three twenty eight. There is no longer Jew or Greek. There is no longer slave or free. There is no longer male and female, as opposed to or, which this is what biblical scholars do, right? They go, and, not or. For all of you are one in Christ Jesus. So is there this idea that some scholars think before there was Adam and Eve, when there was only one, right? When there was only one human, that that human was somewhat androgynous, right? If that human had no gender, because without female, there is no male. So until there was Eve, I'll use the word Eve, I'm not going to bore you with who had what name when, but, but until there was Eve, right, there was no Adam. Adam is a Hebrew word for earth creature, right? Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Adam comes out of the dust. And the idea is that that unpaired creature had no gender. So that when Paul says male and female, as opposed to male or female, he's talking about this pre-divided earth creature. And that's what happens when we enter Christ. We are, we, there is a piece of our gender identity that is no longer important, no longer insignificant. Other people think, because of that, that this was McDonald. I mean, McDonald started it, the scholar named McDonald, but this idea that this is, this is a baptismal formula, right? And then I started reading about this baptismal formula. Baptismal formula, there is a new 
scholarship out, there used to be a rabbinic daily prayer. There used to be a rabbinic daily prayer, I am grateful I was born a Jew and not a Gentile. I am grateful I was born an Israelite. I am grateful I was born a man and not a woman. And that was a daily prayer. One of the difficulties, parenthetical sidebar, parenthetical sidebar, one of the difficulties of Christian feminist theology is that we all need to be very careful not to make it sound like Christians have somehow taken Jewish patriarchy ideas and reclaimed them, saved them, right? That, and, and so that always when you hear rabbinic prayer or love, there's a bell goes off for Christian feminist theologians, right? Because it's like careful, steady as she goes, right? <laughs> I do not want to make it sound like the rabbis had this prayer and thank goodness for Paul because he came along, you know, and saved women, right? That isn't, that isn't what I want to say. And because that isn't what I want to say, I've sat on this thing, this rabbinic prayer, right? Like, why would Paul take this triad, make it what it is? And in terms of spirituality, right, I thought, finally, after some time, well, I'm grateful I was born a woman and not a man. And that's not a hierarchical statement, right? I'm, I'm grateful I was born an American. That has made my life really easy, you know? I'm grateful I have Christian roots to go back to and mine out of spirituality. That isn't a hierarchical statement, right? So if I live in this prayer, right, and I say, well, I'm going to try really hard not to be defensive towards this prayer, right? I'm going to try really hard not to approach this prayer like, hey, you know, we don't, we don't thank God we're better than other people. That's not spiritual. That doesn't sound right. And it's like, well, that's not the prayer. Right? The prayer isn't, I'm better. I thank God I'm better. Right? And to a certain degree, it's like, I'm super grateful I'm a female in this lifetime. It's working out really well for me. You know? I, I love it. You know? And, and it is fine. And I am also aware that in my spirituality, that role of femaleness isn't the only thing that's going on. Right? And that isn't, that's not the only thing that's happening. I'm not only female in my spirituality. It's not a particularly, it's not the most important part of my identity. And I like this play of identity, like what is my identity and what does that mean to my spirituality and what parts of it loosen, you know, like uh, loosen up when I get into biblical text and what parts of it tighten up, right? Like what parts of it are like, oh, I'm really tightly around wild about that part of my identity. And if biblical spirituality is to challenge that, right, then I am, I, 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 there's, my daughter and I a couple of times, twice we've gone and done a week-long family meditation with Thich Nhat Hanh and the Plum Village people. And one of the meditations, you stand and you move through these parts of your identity, one in gratitude, right? So you say, um, you start big. You start with the biggest part of your identity you can think of. I'm grateful I'm a human being. You know, I love my brain, my disposable thumb, you know, I like being able to communicate with you, all these things I think of. And then you go on the ground and you put your head down and you ask for forgiveness for the parts of that part of your identity. I ask for forgiveness for what we're doing to the ecology, to the earth, right, in my humanness, right? And you stand back up and you think of the next biggest part of your identity, right? Like, I'm grateful I'm female. Right? And I am. I'm very grateful that I'm a female. Right? And then bow and ask for forgiveness in these ways. In what way do I participate in a social structure that oppresses women or in my gender? You know, I ask for forgiveness in those things. In my imagery, then, there's, I kind of pour it out because I think through my head. So when my head touches the ground, it's, it's helpful for me because I'm, I'm just a big head rolling through the planet. And, um, you know, oh, I'm grateful I'm an American. You know, I love the principles. I'm grateful, you know, for these. And then, you know, bow down and touch the earth. And I am, you know, the way that America has oppressed indigenous people, 
you know, that these are an up and down you go, narrower and narrower and narrower into your identity, right? And I, that's what I, that's what I think Paul's doing. I mean, that's what Paul is challenging me here to do, I should say, right? That's Paul, I mean, I'm really, you know, challenged by this idea of in Christ, somehow in this identity, of taking on the role of a Christian or taking on the lessons of Christianity that I will loosen parts of my identity. I will lose them even. And maybe that is spiritual, right? And maybe it's intellectual, maybe it's both. You know, I, I think my form of biblical spirituality, how I use it and how I work it, it can, it can be frustrating for people like, well, I don't want to study four lines for four years. Like, that's not really what I wanted. I don't want to read four books about one part of Galatians. That's terrible. <laughs> and it's, and I think that's great. You know, like, then, then we can have a really super interesting conversation. You know, I, I'm, I don't think the way I'm doing it is the only way or the right way. I just, particularly when I talk here, I try to just talk about how I do it. You know, because that's, that's, that's how I do it, and, and it's more authentic. Uh, but I'm certainly not trying to say, you know, the right thing is to, you know, show up with three different books about the same topic, and, you know, <laughs> and, and work through them. Uh, but I have, I, that is, those are, that is how my, that is how my biblical spirituality works, right? That I, I can be comfortable and uncomfortable. I can find scholars that support my idea, and I really like that. And eventually, even against, even when I don't want to, right? Even when it's like, I don't want to find a scholar that contradicts this other scholar, right? I, I still inevitably will, you know, just because of how things work. Um, no. The last thing I just want to say about this identity thing, we talked about Job mm -hmm. last year or the year before together, and I've been thinking a lot about Job since, and kind of the same thing. I've been thinking about how the narrative of Job is like a narrative of a man who had it all, right? That's how Job starts, right? And then a narrative of a man who had it all and lost it. And then a narrative of a man who had it all and lost it and encountered God. And then it is a narrative of Job. Right? Then Job becomes who Job is. Right? By working through all of these narratives, all of the different identities of Job. Right? That Job became Job after working through all of these different narratives of Job. And, uh, and that that has become more important to me, right? That the, the self-identity, the narrative of Gina or of you, of all of us, is the whole story, right? Not just one part of the story. Um, the whole path, until we encounter it. It is. 10.07. We are supposed to wrap up at 10.15. Um, we could talk together as a big group, or you could talk, I have, there's tables together, whichever one, if someone has something they want to share with a big group, we could do that. Group at large. Yes? Question in, in that prayer, and I'm thankful for you, I'm yeah. man, is it is it more like saying I'm thankful for the blessings that have come along with that part of my identity rather than you're saying rather than a hierarchy right. or a comparative thing? Is that an, an appropriate way of understanding? I think so, yes. Right? I think so. I, I, I think it is, and being born even a rabbi or a priest, right, at, in the ancient times, um, that that was, it was, you were born into that family. So you were born into the family of Levi or you were born into the family of Aaron, 
right? That it, so you, you can just be grateful for that accident of birth. It's almost like saying, I have certain privileges yeah. that I had nothing to do I with. I have nothing to do with them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm grateful to God. I mean, they're definitively grateful to God, right? They're not grateful to themselves, to each other. They're not grateful to uh, the system, right? And, I, and, and that expression of gratitude towards God leads me right there, too, right? But then it's gratitude, right? It's some kind of understanding. That this is, I'm grateful for this life, right? I'm just interested in, um, as you talk about your process, and obviously you're, part of this is very individual, you're reading and you're contemplating, and, but then you're also discussing, um, and then maybe you can't even answer this question, but in this process as you go deeper, is it, is it like 50-50 of on your own reflecting and prayer and study and then discuss, like, I'm just that, because you know, some people I think the conversation piece is the big piece and some people individually, but I think that you've got this, both of it happening, and I'm just interested in, is it more on your own, or is it more in group, or is it, maybe it changes from topic to topic? No, right, that is a really great question. I'm, for the purposes of an analogy, I'm gonna say 50-50, okay. right? In a general way, I don't think my brain alone brings a lot to the party, right? <laughs> Um, <laughs> like, you know, what I, like, I don't think I have very many, like, fantastic ideas from my, from the thinking, but I think the spiritual preparation of that alone time, right, makes me ready to go out and talk to other people. Even just the example of talking to Vince on the phone, it's like, I gotta get off the phone and, and just just to kind of stare at this piece of paper for four days, right? Because I'm, I'm so loaded in my response. Mm -hmm. and, and in that sense, I, I have to go off and kind of be by myself. But I don't think I'm, how do I say this? I think a lot of my presuppositions are challenged with other people right. more than they are alone, right? I don't, I don't challenge my presuppositions very well by myself. <laughs> you know, that, that doesn't. Yeah, I'm terrible at that. <laughs> yeah, but I do, and I need my alone time. I'm not an extrovert entirely. I, I mean, I just need my alone time in general. So, yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? And they talked about, we were up to Galatians 3. And this is an interfaith, and mostly people are evangelical. They did not even talk, not one word was said about 28, verse 28. I was absolutely I was mute. <laughs> this, is, this passage, this 328, uh, in Christ there is neither male nor female. And that passage is so it, it's sort of like it's, when I read it, it's in red. <laughs> and yet nobody saw it as having any importance whatsoever to comment on. Which goes to the different ways in which we come to scripture and faith and all the rest of it. But I can't stand it. <laughs> about it. 
his own call, sense of call. There was a man, there was a man. He doesn't, he even finds himself mysterious. And so God, others, the church, there's a something about it that is wonderful, and yet how sharp his attacks, how he names people who are uh, doing harm to the church, how he uh, has a sharp opinions about everything again and again. So he, as you say, self contradicts but it is so fascinating to find that. And I think freeing for us, because we are so inclined to logical and organized and uh, in engineering in our thinking that we don't allow for ourselves to have two ideas at the same time <laughs> or to have to, to kind of weave our way through the days and nights of opposites in our and, and that is one of the things that I wish we could recover from our Jewish heritage, because Jews do it all the time. Right. They love to do that. We, not so fast. Right. Yeah, they are, they're, they're happy with the paradox. They are. Yeah. Yeah. You'll have to come next week when we're talking about the Gospels. <laughs> <laughs> the Gospel of... No, I'm comparison of the kind of oh. I'm just in a survey. Oh. Kind of the same kind of the same thing. Yeah. Oh wow. So another thing that we try to do in the interfaith Bible study is to is to say, well, this is what this is in this gospel and this is different in this gospel. Then they scratch their heads they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you.